budget is limited, the best thing you can do is put a band-aid on a heart attack, put some performance springs, heavy-duty sway bars, heavy-duty shocks on the standard suspension format. And lots of people are convinced that this is the way to go. For some, that may be the case if they're uh, trying to keep the car in its original format. That's not our aim at RRS. Today we're going to talk about the evolution and design of suspension and steering for the cars that we love so much. All born in the muscle car era of the 60s and the 70s. Now it starts with a bit of a story that goes back to the 50s. And in that era, most cars were not monocoque chassis. They had a frame, the suspension was attached to that and the body sat on that frame. In the 60s, we had the advent of monocoque chassis. Those monocoque chassis required a different type of suspension and steering integration because the loads were distributed through that bodywork in a completely different fashion. Uh, we had a number of other changes that happened. Tire technology changed and a whole stack of new inventions just burst onto the scene throughout the 60s and 70s, uh, most notably safety features, seat belts, uh, collapsible steering columns, laminated screens, a whole range of features that we take very much for granted. Even the standardisation of fitting a radio, a transistorised radio into a car, headrests, all sorts of things that we haven't seen that kind of proliferation of invention even in the past two decades. Uh, for sure we've had technological advances in computer design, analysis, fuel injection and electronic ignition, but just about all of that is born off the back of development through those absolutely wonderful years where we love the muscle car era as an outgrowth of all of those sort of developments and of course the classic iconic cars that we love to see and drive. And that's where things really change. In those early days of pioneering, uh, we had cross-ply tyres. Cross-ply tyres were the primary part of a suspension system. Uh, unfortunately, there was a downside with a cross-ply tyre, and this is a thing called the slip angle. In other words, the angle that the tyre deflects next to the rim. When you're hard in a corner, that slip angle can be really, really a large angle. And consequently, certain things like steering axis inclination, Ackerman angle, uh, all of these very important things that were refined and understood in the 60s with the likes of uh, Colin Chapman in Formula One, uh, and we saw m monstrous leaps in technology in Formula One throughout the 60s and 70s. And as a consequence, what we're going to explain today is the evolution of the suspension in our loved muscle cars, like a Mustang uh, from the 60s through to the 70s, uh, or an XP Falcon, or even a GDHO, how things have changed. And I'll just explain some things. And it starts with the core of what the chassis was about. And so a lot of things were designed to fit into that chassis and distribute loads. So they had to come up with a suspension system that was affordable and easy to assemble. So they put in, into our Fords, a double A arm or upper and lower control arm assembly. Right? Now these had pros and cons in its era. Uh, the first thing was with the cross ply tyres, it was pretty compliant, so you could absorb most of the small bumps through the tyre. Nowadays, with modern radial tyres, and remember that they came in in the late 70s, so things changed radically. Uh, we had the advent of radial tuned suspension, which was a little bit of a joke in many ways because it was a bit of a uh, band aid on a heart attack as far as this old stuff is concerned. Now, one of the key things in uh, changing to a stiffer tyre, particularly low profile tyres, is that your response time or your reaction to uh, road surface has to improve. These were very slow reacting systems. When you had a, a shock absorber mounted on a spring saddle and your spring pivoting on that, we've got a different motion ratio from the wheel to the spring. Now that motion ratio or leverage action on the spring means that this spring has to be huge to support the weight of the vehicle. 
nearly two and a quarter times uh, the, the vehicle's weighed weight is in the poundage of this spring. And it, and it can vary a lot more than that as well. Added to that, over a shorter range, this tiny little shock absorber that fits inside here, even with heavy duty ones, uh, has to dampen this great big spring. Consequently, it has a limitation on how much it can control. What we all want now is a suspension system that is compliant, that's comfortable, sticks to the road, and handles like a beauty. So the most important thing is understanding what it takes to get to that point. And we've had so much technology that has changed over the years to make that possible. And RRS has been incorporating all the latest and greatest designs uh, very, from our very first start of manufacturing products, you can see an evolution of uh, design even within our short range. So we're constantly trying to improve things. Now we'll just examine some of the basics of uh, the original suspension. Firstly, this is a 1966 Mustang stub axle and it has a number of design features in it that are very important to understand. Uh, one of them is Ackerman angle. Ackerman angle, as a sort of crude analysis, is determined by drawing a line through the ball joint pivot, tie rod end, and it should, if you draw a line from left and right, intersect in the middle of the differential housing. Now, they don't all do that. And the idea of this Ackerman angle is that uh, it produces an effect on the steering geometry that when you turn the wheel, the inside wheel turns a tighter circle than the outside wheel. If it didn't, the tyres would be fighting against each other. Now what's really interesting, when you look at any of the workshop manuals for uh, vintage Falcons and Mustangs, as an example, XK to XP, or in the US, a 63 Sprint, something of that sort of nature, when you look at the uh, toe-in on turns, it's measured with one wheel fixed at 20 degrees and the other one is 21 degrees. Now this is nowhere near enough uh, towing on turns for a modern radial tyre and it is tooled in. With cross ply tyres, it didn't matter in its day because the tyre would just deflect. Then on uh, the XR Falcon and of course uh, later Mustangs, 67 on, uh, they introduced 20 degrees on one wheel, 17 and three quarters or thereabouts tow in on the other. This was starting to get closer, but you have to have this more accurate now for a modern radial tyre because the slip angle is completely different. Then we've got other features. Another angle that's uh, a really important angle that's tooled into the components uh, is the steering axis inclination. Now the steering axis inclination is determined by the location of the pivot points. Consequently, any suspension system that incorporates an original stub axle has these design flaws as well. So RRS has calculated the correct steering axis inclination for all the different vehicles and we've tooled it in. Uh, this is something you cannot adjust. You can adjust camber, you can adjust caster, you can adjust towing. A lot of the other angles you can't. Now there's a number of other things that are influential on the way the car handles. An example is camber gain. A camber gain, as the suspension travels, should go negative because as the car rolls, the wheel should be still in full contact with the road. Again, there's a number of limitations on that. Shelby had a modification where they lowered the upper control arm this unit, changed the pivot point on the upper so it had camber gain. It wasn't a huge amount of camber gain, but it made a substantial difference. But it introduced a number of other things which are really important to understand. And it's one of the most neglected things of uh, fixing up when a Shelby mod is done of lowering the upper controller. It's bump steer. Now, all of these older vehicles had a huge amount of bump steer. Uh, some people, uh, when they're checking their bump steer for the very first time, are totally shocked and they think there's something wrong with their vehicle. Well, yes and no, there, there was something wrong. It was the original design. 
we have a much higher expectation. Now, as an example, an XP Falcon, uh, with all the best wheel alignment settings with all of its standard components, has about an inch and a quarter of bump steer as a minimum. This is a huge amount. That means that the wheels are towing in and out as it goes through its range of travel. A 66 Mustang, very similar. A number of other sort of uh, design features in the original stub axle design is that they used a tapered roller bearing. Now there's merits in that, there's also disadvantages. Uh, one of the key disadvantages is because they are tapered rollers, the hub on this unit inside here can actually rock around on this sub axle on high loads. The cure in a race car is to put a machine tapered sleeve between the two bearings so that the bearing cones are clamped up hard. Now this is quite an involved sort of process. Nowadays they don't do that anymore. They use bearing hubs. One of the disadvantages of a tapered roller setup is that there's no uh, method of locating those bearings in a standard setup. The normal adjustment is you just tighten up the bearing until it just loads up, tighten up a little bit more, back it off so you've got some preload on the bearing to stabilise the hub. Otherwise you end up with the thing wobbling around. Nowadays, that isn't used anymore. Uh, just about every modern car design uses a bearing hub. The bearing hub arrangement is quite different and we'll explain about that later. In the lower control arm part of this system, here we have the lower control arm out of uh, XW Falcon. number of things about this that you need to observe. Firstly, the front rubbers are very, very compliant. Part of the reason was to absorb shock on the road and to allow some articulation at this particular joint because as it moves through its range of travel, it's articulating. Also, it has a rubber bushing in this end. And as you can see from this, which isn't that old, it's just been used on country roads, all the rubber has deteriorated. This is also another point of deflection. Added to that, the ball joint design. Now you'll notice it has a cup on the bottom. Inside this cup is a spring-loaded seat. And you can see, when we demonstrate this, how much movement this actually has. And when you uh, hit bumps in the road, it can dislocate the ball joint off of its seat and start to float around. This is another area of inaccuracy. So some suspension designers have decided to put the shock absorber mounted onto this lower controller. Now, normally that would be quite okay. And in some circumstances, uh, it is a short-term fix for motion ratio and also reaction time. However, the circuit of load, and we've got to bear this in mind, whenever you look at uh, ball joint design or suspension formats, the original load came through the wheel, transferred through the stub axle, up through this upper location, into the upper ball joint, through the spring saddle, through the spring into the chassis. So the primary load bearing point is actually the top of the shock tower. Now, if you have your spring on the lower control arm, and this is a crude analogy, so it's actually mounted at this location, where is the load being transferred to? Through to the lower inner at this point. So these now become Instead of guiding points, weight-bearing points. And the chassis simply isn't designed for that. And unless you go to a major reconstruction of those chassis points, and you look at any suspension design that has its load-bearing on the lower control arm, its weight load-bearing, you'll find that the whole construction of that chassis is much, much more robust than a Falcon or a Mustang. So, that's one area. Then you've got the connection of all of these points to the steering system. Now, in the steering system, there's an outer tie rod end with an adju uh, original adjuster sleeve. This is a very crude design. 
a split sleeve that has clamps. Anybody who's uh, fiddled with these knows that this is just such a pain. For one, trying to keep it looking neat and tidy. The other, trying to adjust it, and, in, and invariably they all get knurled up and squashed out. And there's just simply better ways of doing it. Some of these caster rods have no provision for adjustment. They relied on shims. And it, again, when you look at some of these old rods, they're pretty deteriorated now because typically they're over 40 years of age. So they're not very good serviceable items. Need to be replaced to make the car safe and to perform better. If you introduce adjustments on these things, you have to do it properly. You can't just turn a new thread onto this. You have to use the right materials. Yeah. These tie rod ends connected to a drag link and to an idler arm. This is an original steering box out of a GDHO. 16 to 1. GTHO, handling option. <laughs> Quite interesting in its day. And a steering box is an interesting animal to examine at any given point in time. Um, firstly, there was a number of connections uh, to your steering wheel. In 1966 uh, was the last year of what we call a hard shaft system or a non-collapsible steering column. So it actually had a shaft that was a big solid shaft that went straight into the steering box. And of course we no longer have that in any modern car. And the simple reason was if you had a severe frontal impact, that steering shaft was a spear that went through your chest. So they introduced a collapsible steering column. The collapsible steering column was connected to the steering box uh, by what we affectionately call a rag joint. This rag joint was a flexible coupling to take up chassis misalignment and also to allow for uh, another cushioning effect between the steering and consequently this is another rubbery feel to your handling option. This particular steering box it is out of a GDHO uh, it had the quickest ratio in its day, 16 to 1, and uh, which meant it had somewhere between uh, four and a quarter and four and a half turns lock to lock. Modern cars are all below three turns lock to lock, and they also have a tighter turning circle, uh, for the most part that is. And when you compare it to the feel of a modern Falcon, uh, this is a horror. It's heavy, non-power steer, and it's heavy to pick up as well. Modern rack and pinion systems are incredibly light by comparison. So we've got another feature inside this. It's called a worm and sector. So we have the worm that drives through this shaft, the sector that drives through here. When you have it on full lock, the two gears move out of mesh, so you end up with a huge amount of free play in the steering. In the centre position, that's all acceptable, it's nice and close, but because you've got all these turns, you get to a point where it's just nothing there. Modern rack and pinions, constant mesh. Consequently, rack and pinion is the design choice of just about every major sports car manufacturer and GT performance vehicle. This in turn is connected to a drag link which connects the two tie rod ends to the outer links of the stub axles. There's no real major design for in the drag link unless it's a ram steering drag link and we'll examine that later on. That is a design nightmare. It was the best option that they had in its day but hopelessly inadequate for a nice responsive sort of road feel and something that's going to produce a, a performance outcome as far as handling. So when you examine most of the vintage sports cars, they were all Armstrong steering. In other words, you had to have some real muscle to turn the wheel. <laughs> that was the power assist. It was all about muscle. And I think to a large degree, the muscle car era was on two levels, the muscular look of the cars and the muscular requirements to drive them. All of our expectations have changed because we drive modern cars. So what RRS is about is about 
using modern technology in the classic cars that we love so much to bring them into this new millennium so that we can have the best of both worlds. An iconic look with something that can corner carve like nobody's business, provide ease of comfort, a range of uh, different settings so that you can adjust it for track, drag racing, whatever the application may be. Now, in all of these eras, we have a number of other features that integrate into this. And we've seen uh, the adaption of uh, the most common type of, if you like, hot rod conversion, which is a Mustang 2 front end. Now, the Mustang 2 front end is another story altogether. Firstly, I'll explain that it's a monocoque chassis. When you put a Mustang 2 front end in, you are changing all of the chassis loading points. For instance, when you look at a Mustang where the steering box bolts up, it's on the widest part of the rail. And that's because there's a twisting rolling action with the resistance to the road. It has to be distributed through that widest part of the rail. Then in turn, where the suspension load is carried is through the upper part of the shock tower. It's distributed through the inner fender apron panel, through the uh, guard rail edges, through the guards themselves because it's a monocoque chassis. When you put a Mustang 2 in, you cut all of that away and you integrate all of the weight of the vehicle, all of the steering load into the narrowest part of the chassis rail. Now that's acceptable in a show car, in a vehicle that's uh, going to be used for very limited sort of purposes, possibly drag racing, uh, and it's quite acceptable if you go to a great deal of testing to check out the beaming and torsioning and integrate it into a monocoque chassis design. However, we've got a number of other design flaws with it. And you can check this out. I mentioned Ackerman angle. The angle between these two points that should intersect at the middle of the differential in the rear. When you have a front steer system, this Ackerman angle is generated by moving this point in that direction so that the angle goes through to that rear axle. Invariably, the original Mustang 2 have similar designs like the Tirana front end, HK, HG, uh, Monaro's, uh, let me think of a couple of others, Cortina. These are all basically the Mustang 2 format have absolutely dreadful Ackerman angles. Part of the limitation was they couldn't run this uh, tie rod end location in the ideal spot because it interfered with the rim. Now we have big diameter rims. So it is possible to fix that problem. Camber gain can be a real major problem. Bump steer can be a real major problem. Putting an appropriate power assist can be a real problem. Track variation, which is another story altogether, and track variation needs to be demonstrated. Track variation is when you jack up the car and you watch the wheels at the very base on the ground, they're at a particular position. When you lower the car, they move in or out. That's track variation. On a 66 Mustang, that movement is about three inches. The track variation on a 67 model, uh, whether it be a Falcon or a Mustang, improved dramatically. And you'd ask the obvious question, why did they make it such a way? Uh, you know, in the early XK to XP Falcons and 66 Mustangs with this massive track variation. Uh, you definitely don't want your wheels and tyres doing this action as it goes across the road. Uh, this is tracking the car all over the place. So what was the reason? The main reason was just a really simple one. The tyre technology of the day. It didn't really matter. As tyres improved, 67, 68, and the requirements of driving, it had greater demands, then people wanted a better track variation. They didn't want the car to track. So the design changed as consumer demand and expectation and tyre technology changed. So in the different types of formats of suspension, the Mustang 2 is an option. The problems with it can be fixed. The ride height can be set by mounting it in the chassis in the appropriate location. And it's just all about the choice of what you want as an outcome as far as your car is concerned. If you want a drag racer, I can see it as being an okay option. 
If you want a show car, I can see it as being an OK option. If you want the pinnacle of performance and handling, I think it's really limited. And it's, at the very best, you can patch it up. The pros and cons of a double A arm system to a strut front end. This has been hotly debated over the years. And in its original format, a strut front end, and we're talking about in the 50s, because it was introduced by McPherson as a McPherson strut, was used in old Anglias and some Zephyrs and things like that. Uh, it had some serious drawbacks. It used to bind under braking, so it would limit the steering feel. That's a thing of the past, it no longer occurs, simply because of the des design within the strut legs themselves. There's double glacier bearings in high performance struts now. There is no bind issue. And you can see that with uh, the most common usage of the strut front end in rally cars. This is a vindication of that design. Now, a double A arm system has all sorts of merits. However, when you look at a NASCAR, a supercar, the design format of that suspension means a major redesign of the chassis. Uh, Formula One, IndyCar, all have double A arms, but they're incredibly long arms with a very small range of travel. So in the design parameters of what you're looking for is reaction time, camber gain, correct relationship of roll centre to centre of gravity, which there was no consideration in all of these systems. An ideal thing that you can tool into the vehicle, which is some height gain in a corner, in other words, anti-roll, so you can back off on uh, sway bar. This can be tooled in, and I'll explain that later on when we examine steering spindles versus bearing hubs and so on and so forth. None of those things have been incorporated into the Mustang 2 frame. We have another suspension format where it produces a coilover, and a coilover is definitely better than this type of system. But it's mounted to the lower controller. This affects the chassis. It also incorporates old technology of using the original stub axle, which has some major shortcomings in it. However, that suspension system for the budget conscious is a good alternative. If you want to go to the next level, you replace all of this tooling with components that are tooled out of the best types of materials with the best possible design features. That'll cover all of the expectations that you want to have in your muscle car or your vintage Falcon so that you can drive with the best of them. Now, the facts of the matter are that all of these are different choices determined by budget because you cannot buy a Rolls-Royce if you only have a high Hyundai budget. So you have to determine what you want and what you can get with your budget. One of the key things though is not wasting money. It's better sometimes to uh, modify what you've got if you've got a limited budget rather than cut off your car and put a Mustang 2 front end if your expectation is that your car's going to handle particularly well. Uh, some of the proof of this is that the Mustang 2, which was a 1974 Mustang, never won a single road race of, of any series. It, it, it may have won one-offs, but no series. There was no accolades for that particular vehicle. Uh, the only real accolade they got was that it got some major film footage on Charlie's Angels. However, some of the more classic sort of things that set a standard, uh, like California Kid, uh, one of my most favourite movies, Martin Sheen's first, was all about tuning the handling of that uh, three-window coupe and how he could take that dead man's curve uh, faster than anybody else. So that's been the aspiration of just about every car modifier uh, from the get-go. So the main thing now is understanding the most appropriate design, the tunability of that design, the maintenance levels of that design, its serviceability. Because one of the things that happens to most people who push the outer limits is they find out where it is and have a bit of an accident. Um, done it myself a couple of times, maybe a few more. But anyway, so in summary, 
there's a number of key things when making a choice about suspension, steering or brakes. It's important for any car builder when he's making the choices of what suspension, brakes, steering he's going to put into his car, that this has a holistic effect that's integrated into the monocoque chassis. When you make these choices, there's a whole stack of design parameters. It's drivability, it's ease of maintenance, it's ease of fitment, it's durability, and it's performance outcomes. And all of these things are what RRS is focused on.